So a few weeks back, Nelson asked me to uh, look at the idea of what's my purpose. And uh, I think that's a great idea. I think that as Christians, we should be looking at our purpose. But I think it's incomplete for us to simply look at our purpose as individuals because our purpose as individuals finds its foundation in our purpose as the church. And not just as the people who are meeting in this room, but as the church in Kirkland Lake or as the church universally in the world. And so um, we have to first ask ourselves, what's the church even for? Now, I'm starting with a couple of assumptions here. And the first is that God is working in the world. He wants to do something in the world. I don't think that's too controversial in a church. And the second assumption is that God's primary means by which he's doing this work in the world is through the church. So God has a mission, and he's using the church to do that mission. So what is God's mission? It's God's desire that we behave ourselves, that we get plenty of sleep and exercise, wash our hands, eat our vegetables. No, I think God is up to something a little different. He's obviously not opposed to good behavior, but God is at work reconciling creation to himself. He created the world to live in relationship with himself and with each other, and that's gotten off track. And God is in the business of restoring things back to the way that he had intended them to. And so in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, Paul talks about what God is doing. In, in, and if, of course, if you've read Ephesians, which we preached through a little while ago, you'll know that Paul would never say something in this book anyways, in, you know, five words when 15 would do. So uh, in a really flowery word, he says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So God is at work bringing everything under the kingship or lordship of Jesus Christ, and that he's basically bringing a new age into existence. Now, for us to unpack this idea of age, we have to first understand sort of what Jews and then what Christians mean by it, because it's not necessarily something that's very intuitive to our understanding. So early Judaism starts with this idea that if you do good, then good stuff's going to happen to you. If you read the book of the law, particularly Deuteronomy, there's blessings and curses. And it seems to imply that good things come to good people and bad things come to bad people. But over time, they realize that there needs to be a little bit more nuance in their understanding of good and bad and how those things play out in the world. Because if you spend any time with anybody, you know that sometimes bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And so they came to a conclusion that while things might be out of balance in a temporary sense, that in a long-term sense, God is always bringing those two things back into balance. And so we see little acts of judgment throughout history. It might be that a king is particularly bad, and he seems to get away with it for a little while, but eventually something bad happens to that king, and the people are set free. And there is a measure of balance that comes back to that whole good-bad equation it still never comes back fully. And so they thought about it and had to reimagine their understanding of how the world works. And they came to the conclusion that this age that we live in, this time, is characterized by darkness, by spiritual evil. But that God was going to step in at some point and he was going to bring in a new age which is going to be characterized by his presence with his people, by righteousness and justice. Uh, A a way of diagramming it would be like this. Right now we live in this present evil age, which is darkness, and then there's going to be some cataclysmic event, God coming down to sort things out. He's going to punish the the guilty and and reward the righteous, and then there'll be a new age. There'll, There'll be like a reset button that's been pressed on the world, and things will be better now, and things will be just. So there was an idea, oh, sorry, go back to that. There was an idea that the day of the Lord was the coming of this divine king who would rule his people of Israel. But then Jesus comes and he sort of throws this whole idea on its head because Jesus' disciples realize very quickly that he is the Lord. 
and that it looks pretty dark for a while when he's crucified and dies, and they're thinking maybe we backed the wrong horse, but then he raises from the grave, or from the dead, and they realize, yes, he is indeed this messianic king that we've been expecting, but the life that we live isn't characterized by justice and righteousness and God's presence with us, is it? And so they have to rethink what this looks like, and so they come up with uh, this idea here, that there is a present age and that when Jesus comes and gives us his ministry and dies and rises, that he inaugurates the kingdom of God, but that the kingdom of God exists alongside this present evil age. And so one day he is going to come back and going to consummate that kingdom. But in the meantime, we live in this place where there are two opposing kingdoms happening at the same time. And so what do we make of that? Well, um, it's, I think of it as sort of like uh, an ancient warfare where they, put a se- where they laid siege to a city. When you lay siege to a city, it's going to be a long, long wait. But once you've breached the walls of that city, then the city is ripe for the picking. The outcome of the battle is a foregone conclusion. And so what happens is that Jesus breaches the walls of the age to come and then leads the charge through the gates. But we still have to invade that place and still have to subdue it, even though the outcome of the battle is a foregone conclusion. And that is the age in which we find ourselves. And so there is a a decisive victory between the ages has been won on the cross, but that we live in a time when that victory has not been brought into its full effect. So, the, act, the, the life of the church is meant to be an act of warfare on this present evil age. That we take the fight to the enemy by bearing witness to Jesus' victory on the cross and by living under God's authority even in the midst of this present evil age. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out this incredibly difficult ethical agenda. He tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to never say something that's not true. He tells us to not look at uh, another person with lust. He tells us not to um, ever make a promise that we aren't keeping. And people look at that and say, oh, wouldn't that be nice? Jesus is sort of laying out what life is going to be like in heaven, in the age to come. And in a sense, that's kind of true. He is telling us what the life of the new age is like but he's telling us how to live the life of the new age in this present age. I can't imagine that you have to learn to forgive your enemies if there are no enemies in the new age. And yet, so he's telling us how to live as people who are subverting the old age in the midst of this, or how to live the life of the new age that subverts the old age in the presence of the old age. So Jesus' example shows us that many of the things that we take for granted aren't necessarily things that we have to accept. We see a world that's divided. We see racism. We see sexism. We see greed and xenophobia. And we just say, well, these are the things that are going to be with us. We've just sort of given up a hope of ever being rid of them. And yet Jesus rejects them. And he calls us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live in a way that rejects them as well. And if we live together as a group of people whose lives demonstrate this rejection of evil, then we show the world that it is Jesus who is in charge, not Satan. So when we follow Jesus' example of faithfulness and surrender to God's will, and that's made manifest in service to others, particularly suffering service to others, we are subverting this present evil age. Now, I think this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. This does not mean that we ever employ physical violence. Uh, All this talk about warfare might lead people to that conclusion, but of course the the enemies that we face are spiritual enemies, not physical enemies. And so guns and knives and fists are of absolutely no value in bringing about this new age. In fact, they're counterproductive. That's why Paul in Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, 
we are meant to live as if Jesus really is Lord in the midst of a place where everybody else refuses to acknowledge that reality. Now, there are ways in which our individual lives can demonstrate this. We love other people. We serve them. We practice generosity and faithfulness and forgiveness. But there are ways in which it is only as we practice this life of the new age together as a community of believers that the world can see Jesus' lordship at work. And I think of two of these things, and the first is inclusivity. We live in a world that's divided. Is this controversial? It'd be funny if somebody got up and said no, because that would sort of prove my point, wouldn't it? But uh, <laughs> we have a growing nationalist movement in many countries right now. There's racial su uh, suspicion. There's urban and rural economic and political divides. In the last election uh, in Canada, the, uh, the governing party got no seats in Western Canada. So it shows that there's this very different view of how the government should function in different parts of our country. So the world is separated into us as and thems, and sometimes that takes root in the church, but it is not supposed to be so. Scripture tells us that this is not supposed to be what our life together is like. The early church starts out as a Jewish movement. The Holy Spirit drags the church kicking and screaming into becoming a movement that goes beyond the boundaries of the Jewish people. When Peter is called to witness to Cornelius, it's essentially the Holy Spirit's version of grabbing him by the ear and pulling him over and saying, you have to, when Jesus said, go into all the nations, he kind of meant it. But very quickly, the church becomes primarily Gentile, and that causes friction within the church because there are people who believe that practicing Christianity should look more like Judaism and other people that aren't so sure, and they're trying to sort it out. And Paul says that because we are one in Jesus, despite the fact that we are different, we are actually one body. In Ephesians 4, or sorry, 2, 14 and 16, he says, For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace in his one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So in other words, he has, since we are all joined to Jesus, we all belong together. And there's no, we may be Jews and Gentiles, but the fact that we are Jews or Gentiles no longer makes us separate people. It no longer is a, a basis by which we exclude ourselves from each other. Another thing that you see in the early church is that there is socioeconomic divides. You have rich and you have poor, and they both come into the church. In the church in Corinth, they started celebrating the Lord's Supper in uh, sort of a, a bigger, you know, rather than just celebrating the Lord's Supper, they had these events called love feasts. And people would bring in a, a, a feast, and then they would eat the food that they brought in. And so some of the rich people coming, and they bring plenty of good food and wine, and they get drunk and gorge themselves on the food that they bring in. And then maybe the, the slaves, they come, and they don't have anything. And they can't even participate in the Lord's Supper. And Paul is just furious about this. Because he says that they're taking the divisions that characterize life in this present evil age, and they're bringing them into the church where the life of the age to come is supposed to be present. And so he's saying that you cannot treat some people like they're worth more and other people like they're worth less. That is not the life of the age to come. That's in the present evil age. So he says that they are not discerning the body of Christ. In other words, the people who are gorging themselves on the food and looking down their noses on all the people who don't bring anything don't understand that those people are a part of Jesus' body. So their insult to those people is an insult to Jesus as well. So in other words, we are to value each other equally, whether we are rich or poor. We're not to take the same, same um, uh, system of valuing, values that the world has and take that for granted in our church. There are two things that give you value, according to the Bible. The first is that you're made in God's image, and the second is that you are bought with Jesus' blood. 
Those two things are the only thing that give value. It's not how much money you have in the bank. It's not how good-looking you are. It's not how talented you are. It's none of these things. And so in the church, of course, we have hierarchies of leadership at times, but those are functional. They are not designed to say that certain people are worth more than anyone. And so we have to reject the idea that anybody is worth more than anybody else, that anybody is more desirable to come through the door. Oh, if you're middle class and like us, you're welcome in this place. And if you're not, eh, we'd rather you not show up. If we think like that, then we are characterizing the life of the age to come rather than the, or sorry, the life of this present age rather than the age to come. So we are to be a people of inclusivity. The second thing that we need to do is to be a people of reconciliation. So we've all wronged God. The church, uh, for a long time, spent its time blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. But if you read the story, I think what you really see is that we are all participants. Everybody around Jesus falls short of him. And we all fall short of God's standard. Our sin necessitates Jesus' sacrifice. And so we all are, at least indirectly, to blame. And yet God doesn't treat us like people who are guilty of killing his son. Instead, he uses that to bring us into a relationship and to forgive us. And our lives together need to be modeled along the same lines. That we don't take offense at people, but rather we forgive them. And we practice this as individuals. When somebody wrongs us, we forgive them. But as a community, we also practice this too. Because there are historical animosities between different groups of people. When I was a, a missionary in Hungary, I, had a, I was part of a school that taught or that brought in students from all over the world. And in one of the schools, I remember we had a Serb and we had a Bosnian. And in case you missed the news in the 90s, Serbs and Bosnians didn't get along very well. There was a, a lot of bad blood there. And yet, they were able to set aside the differences that said, you're a Serb and you're a Bosnian, so you're supposed to hate each other, because they found that they had a common identity built in Jesus Christ. And in the same way, we are called to set aside the ways and, you know, the historical animosities. If, you know, in Canada, we don't have a lot of, like, enemies, but if, you know, if we believed that the... Americans were our enemies, we would be called to treat Americans with respect, to not allow that animosity that exists between them and us to characterize our relationships. It also means, or sorry, it does not mean, however, that we simply say that all of the bad stuff that's happened between groups doesn't matter. What that generally tends to do is it creates a position where the person who is in the position of authority has, doesn't have to answer for what happened. So a great example would be the way that uh, we as, as white people have used the land of natives in Canada. Um, it was not exactly a, um, historically has not exactly been a, a just um, relationship between the two of them. And if a person, a native uh, person came in and joined us in this community, we could say, well, that was all in the past and Jesus has has made all that moot, so we're just not going to address it. But that just continues to live out this life of division rather than seeking to be reconciled between people. And so what do we do? Well, I'm going to do something that might be controversial. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the Robson-Hudson Treaty territory, and the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Cree, Ojibwe, and Algonquin people. The native land acknowledgement... Sometimes it might seem to us to be an empty thing that a person says. And I've talked to people who are native, they say it's actually quite meaningful to them. It is a reckoning of the way that our forebears have mistreated people. We are actually in a treaty area, but there are lots of unceded areas where the land was basically stolen. And so if a person from one of the Cree, Ojibwe, or Algonquin people came and sat in this room, our job as people of reconciliation is not to say, get over it. Our job is to say, help us understand how you experience this. What, what is your, how do you see this? How have you lived this out? How can we walk with you through this? We can't necessarily set this thing right, but we can give voice to the people 
whose voices are normally suppressed. And so, as the church, we are to be a community that encourages reconciliation between people. We understand that Jesus has offered us reconciliation, and he, uh, he asks us to pass that along to other people and ask that we make the things that we've done right with people or at least to journey alongside them and understand how our actions in the past have made other people hurt and suffer. And so that's what it means, I think, for us to be people whose lives are characterized by the life of the age to come. That we live as if heaven is here right now, even though knowing that we're surrounded by a, a community that is not exhibiting the life of heaven here and now. And then next week, we're going to look at what it looks like to be individuals whose lives are characterized by the kingdom of heaven.